here yet, but we'll just go ahead and start. Um, my name is Mike Montgomery. I'm the research educator for this stream. I'm a, I'm a research scientist in the astronomy department. Uh, the faculty head for our stream is Don Winget, and that's him back there in the corner. <laughs> and um, uh, next to him is Keaton, right there. And yeah, Keaton's a grad student in our group. He's a second year grad student doing his, yeah. I got the stripes going the other way. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and then we have a whole host of mentors who are previous graduates and still working with us. Here's Arena. Um, maybe you just say your names instead of me saying them all. Hi, my name's Arena. I'm a third year student. Yeah, third year. So I've been working in this group for a couple of years now. You can keep going. Is that all our mentors here? Um, no, we also have Kevin. Right, no, no, I mean who are here. Oh, yes. Yeah, Kevin's skiing. <laughs> <laughs> and that tells you about all you need to know. For four years. He's been with us for four years. <laughs> and he's, he's further handicapped because his dad is a math professor in this department. So. He thinks everybody's just real relaxed about everything. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, yeah, and he'll be graduating this year, almost certainly. Um, I'd just like to go over a few of the, the, the details here. So all the contact information is here. I got my email address. Um, there's the web page uh, for the course. We have our web page you may have seen already. This lecture is 3 to 4 on Friday, and you're obviously in the right room. Uh, we've tentatively scheduled, there's a lab on the 15th floor that's filled with computers. It has about 18 computers. And unless everybody comes at once, we have enough space. Um, and that's 15.201. I've tentatively reserved Wednesday and Thursday afternoons from 1.30 to 4. Now, these are general access rooms, so normally anybody can use them. So you could go in there anytime you want. But during these times I've blocked out, it's just for us and nobody else can use the room. Um, so. You guys know your schedules now, right? How many of y'all have a couple hours free time or one hour on one day, one hour on another day on Wednesdays and Thursdays? How good of times are those? Okay, so who doesn't that work real super duper for? Okay, so it seems like that's a good start. We'll go with these times. And again, these are not the only times that you can come in. You can come in absolutely any time and do the labs on the computers. But these are the times when you'll have the most help available when you run into problems. There'll be somebody there to ask questions of. Yeah? Um, will we all have card access to our lib or not? <coughs> oh. I emailed Anita and I never heard back. I, they were supposed to be here. Oh, the card people? Yeah, the card people were supposed to come to this. Uh, you, did you say RLM? Yeah. Yeah. Well, technically, they don't really lock RLM. Well, they have, they have like that door that locks unless it's like past a certain time. Yeah, okay, so you can't get in at 2 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> but right. I, I don't think I can do anything about that for you, but you need a card to get into this room with the computers okay. because otherwise they get stolen. And uh, they were supposed to come here and scan everybody's card. Did somebody, did Keaton leave to go check on that? Okay. I've, who knows? You know, we've been having email problems in our department, and Nita may have never gotten that email that I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I did email that to her, but I guess she might not have seen it. Okay. Well, that's good. All right. So hopefully we'll get that going. Um, let's see. So the course, just as an overview, the first paragraph here says it's exciting. <laughs> um, and it lists a bunch of buzzwords. Um, white dwarfs are... Uh, they're what our sun will become in about five billion years. It'll run out of hydrogen to burn, and so it'll have a core of helium. Eventually, it'll burn the helium, but it won't get hot enough to burn the heavier elements that result from that, and it'll just cool off and lose mass. So our sun is going to wind up about a half a solar mass uh, about six billion years from now, and it'll be a white dwarf. But white dwarfs are forever. They just cool off. and so. Um, you know, they say old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Why, that's really true of white dwarfs. They just fade away, and this fading away takes 10 to 15 billion years. So there's a lot of white dwarfs that have been born in our galaxy that haven't had a time to cool off yet 
down to 3,000 degrees Kelvin. They take forever to cool off that long. And um, so they're all over the place. They're the end result of about 97% of all stars. So you're really studying the end products of almost everything. And it turns out, I'll show you some slides in a bit, that they're actually relevant for uh, studying dark matter, how old the universe is, which we call cosmochronology, and the physics of matter under extreme conditions. Uh, and we're continually thinking and finding new ways to use uh, white dwarf stars. There's a, a neat quote in one of the Feynman lectures we, wrote, we uh, watched last semester where he was talking about inventing a new physical theory you know, that agrees with everything you already know but predicts something new. And he says, you have to be really smart to think of such a thing. And then he says, actually, you have to be really lucky, but it looks like you're really smart. <laughs> you know? And I think a lot of the stuff we do with white dwarfs, it looks like you have to be really smart, but you actually have to be lucky too, right? Like we found this 12-minute um, binary uh, white dwarf where the two white dwarfs are going around each other once every 12 minutes. And it's such a, a violent gravitational system that gravitational radiation is being emitted and the system is gradually shrinking. But in only one and a half, well, almost two years of observations, we can detect the shrinkage of that orbit already. So, you know, who thought you'd be doing general relativity easily by studying white dwarf stars? I mean, I figured this would come up eventually, but it came up right now. You know, and that's something we weren't aware of two years ago. Well, so there's always stuff coming out. Yeah. Comment about luck. Luck has made yes. Sure Right. So we pre-selected these objects to be double white dwarf binary systems, and we were looking for the shortest orbital period systems, and those are the ones we were looking for. So we stacked the odds in our favor. Yeah. When I say look, it's a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's a. You're right, because you can be lucky and still do everything wrong. <laughs> and that doesn't count for anything. And so yeah, you try to do everything you possibly can, but then you're very pleased when you uh, find new objects. So anyway, what I'm saying is we don't know exactly what we're going to be doing in the next year because we're finding stuff all the time. Um, what, what we're going to talk about and hopefully learn something about is how what we do is applied to astrophysics, observation, data acquisition, reduction, analysis, interpretation, instrumentation for some things. Instrumentation means building something. Um, Numerical and physical experiments, running codes. Um, and analytical theory, which is doing stuff with pencil and paper. Um, nobody does everything, but you may wind up doing one or more of these areas. Uh, and our group does all of them. Um, I love this phrase, we will spiral through these areas as we go. Um, spiral, and you may get dizzy. <laughs> Spiraling, the reason we say spiral is if you think of the subject area as this vast field, you know, the temptation is, well, I'm going to start here and walk through the entire thing, you know, like tracing out a groove on a phonograph record. Well, maybe that's not such a good analogy. But, you know, going through it all in order. And that's a great thing, but it takes forever. We only have a semester to get going. Spiraling means you just land somewhere in the middle, you start doing something, you walk into stuff, and you say, oh, I need to know that, oh, I need to know that. Okay, well, that's all I seem to need right now. I keep going. And so you learn the things that you need to know right then. And it's a lot quicker, and it's a lot more interesting. If you were, you know, you can't compress six years of something into one year. Um, well, actually, sort of you can. <laughs> you can. Um, but you can, what you shouldn't do is you can easily spend forever learning something and never get anywhere. As somebody put, I can't remember. Well, yeah, he said it, but the quote I'm thinking of, nobody was ever famous for how much they learned. You know? You could learn everything. You could memorize the Encyclopedia Britannica. And that might get you on the evening news, but it's certainly not going to get you a Nobel Prize. You know what I mean? Or something else worthwhile. It's not going to be a scientific discovery. It's just going to be some sort of feat. Um, and everything you've done so far, and unfortunately a lot of what you will do, is take courses that teach you stuff linearly. And again, that's good, but it's nice to have different experiences where it's like on-the-job training. You know, you're thrown in, okay, learn this, okay, learn that. Well, you never said I was going to have to learn this. Well, you don't really have to learn that. You have to learn these three things about that. And so it's, um, it's not as hard as it sounds, but that's what spiral means. And I kind of like the idea of spiraling and getting dizzy. 
you know, because you may get dizzy. Um, the first half of the course, we're doing weekly labs, and this is more like a traditional lab course. It's a traditional lab course in the sense that I, we give you a sheet that has a lab written out on it, and it says what to do. Um, and then you go to the computer and you do that. Um, it's not a traditional lab course in that it's all on a computer. You know, traditional lab course, you've got pendula or, you know, you're dropping something or you're mixing things together. Um, for our purposes, it works out best for us to do things on the computer almost all the time. So in the first half of the course, you'll be doing that, learning skills that we think you'll need for doing your projects. Now, everybody's going to do a slightly different project. So we have to, and not everybody's going to do the same thing, so we have to have a range of things the labs cover. But we hope that the labs give you a good background. That's pretty much everything that happens up until spring break. After spring break, um, you're going to get, um, you're going to choose projects to work on, and these are actually research projects. And they're going to be done in uh, small groups of approximately three people. And Depending on how many we have, we're going to have somewhere between five and ten of these projects that will be managed by the mentors and by me, and that the goal will be to make significant progress on them by the end of the semester. Um, the, beauty, the beauty of research is that you never know how long it's going to take, and typically things take longer than you think. So I'm thinking of these research projects as they need to get going and be on the order of at least halfway finished by the end of the semester so that if you come back to them, we'll know where to pick up. I don't want research projects that just barely start. Um, it's really, uh, and that's something we're going to guard against and try to get everybody going as soon after spring break as possible. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Don? Yeah, can I just make a comment? Yeah, please, a please do. Quick comments, because yeah, one of the things we we'll walk up here today, yeah. to Beside you, you'll be on camera. <laughs> um, anyway, one of the things I want to mention is what Mike was saying, that what I meant when I said metawar, going back to that point about there's two ways to do science, and metawar wrote this in advice to a young scientist, which I recommend you find a copy of and read. Metawar, you want to write that? Yeah, sure. In the red spot. Um, and and it, there's two ways to do science. One is to go to the library and read everything there is to know or take all the courses there are on the subject, and the other one is to roll up your sleeves and start doing it. Only one of these two approaches works. I'll let you guess which one it is. And that's the, the real idea behind the Freshman Research Initiative, because it, it changes several things for you. One, it means you don't have some old fart like me saying, go study uh, differential equations, go study advanced differential equations, go study uh, third semester quantum mechanics, because it's a darn good idea you should do that. Now, you're learning this stuff because you want to do it, because it's deeply relevant to the thing that you want to do. Uh, you're going, something is going to happen for you in the next few months, maybe the next six months, I don't know. You're going to find out why it is we do science. Why are we scientists? What's the appeal? And, and the fundamental point about it, the thing that's the addictive point, the reason we all do it, whether we admit it or not, is because there will be a moment and you will experience this. You've already experienced when you get an idea, the light bulb goes on for you and you understand how to do a problem or something, but it's a problem, you know, uh, Newton's great grandfather did before you, and every dog who's ever lived since then has done that problem. You're going to learn something about the universe that no human being has ever walked the face of this earth has ever known before. When that happens, you're done, you're hooked. That's doing science. That's what we want you to do. And that will give you a practical motivation. You'll go, oh, wow, this third semester of quantum mechanics, I want that, because I really need to know that to do this. And so you'll be plugged into the idea and the act of doing science. It'll connect you with your courses. And our hope is it will be for you guys, as it has been for our past groups, you will interconnect with each other. It'll give you a small group. UT is a giant, large place. If you haven't figured that out already, I'd be surprised. And so this will provide you with a community, not to talk about just the research, but to talk about anything with. So you're connected to uh, see more senior undergraduates, to graduate students, to uh, research scientists and faculty members. Uh, you're connected to a community of people. And we're here to help you in any way we can. So these are the benefits and the things that we expect to come out of this course, and the things you should be uh, expecting of yourself. So. How much you get out of this, it's an old cliche, the reason it's a cliche is because it's true, 
You're going to get out of this exactly as much as you put in. Now, a true confession time, if you don't mind. Oh, please. We have never done this with a group this size That's before. True. All of our kids have been spectacularly successful in our stream before, but they've had much closer to you know one-on-one -on -one interactions. So our concept in growing this experience a little bit is to try and provide you guys with the same quality of experience of interaction by structuring the course in a way that gives you small groups within this larger group. And we're hoping, it's a hope, this is an experiment. We don't do experiments in people, so don't, don't <laughs> turn the video camera off. Um, but this is an experiment. And we are about trying to make this, all of the mentors, all of, and, and Mike and I, everybody, grad students, everybody you've met, is about trying to make this work. And, but we need your help and your feedback as we go, because we have never done this before with a group this size. So there'll be breakdowns in communication, and you identify those for us if we can't see them as soon as they happen, and we'll fix that. All right? That's what, but, but anyway, so that's, yeah, yeah, no, that's that. just the, my two cents on well, what this it, is for. So the benefits are many beyond the obvious of learning a discipline of science and doing research. And, oh, and, yeah, one, if, how many people think they might be interested in graduate school? Yeah. Okay. Do you guys know what is the number one predictor of academic success? This is based on a 90-year study by the American Institute of Physics. Research experience. Research experience, <laughs> period, paragraph, nothing else is correlated. Uh, your grade point average, there's threshold effects. Standard it's also, exam scores, all of that stuff doesn't really matter. It's also the number one indicator of who gets into grad school. That's, what to just, that's the measure of academic success in this context is not only getting into grad school, but, but doing well. in the field long term. But if you want to get into grad school, experience doing research as an undergrad is essential. Yeah. I think we almost don't admit anybody here in UT Astronomy who has no research experience. Almost. Malali was the last one. Really? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, my uh, student. <laughs> he wrote a great essay. <laughs> but it can happen. Not, not all. Rare. Not all universities have research open, but that's becoming less of an excuse because even if you're a liberal arts college you can work as an intern at NASA for three months one year yeah. and if you don't do that the admissions committee says they're not really that motivated that's and, that's honestly yeah. what they think absolutely and here's the deal from from our perspective if you went to Rice as an undergraduate to Princeton uh, or to Caltech you wouldn't have the edge you have sitting here right now you're getting started doing research now you're not waiting until you're a junior or a senior to get started doing research that's a necessary thing. So you will have a profound edge. And the edge you'll have surprised Mike and I, I think, a little bit at first. And that is, after two years of doing research, a graduate student sort of hits the point where it's actually, and you, you, know, you know this as well as me, Keaton, uh, where it's actually worthwhile working with them. They're a time sink up to that point. But at two years, they magically transform into this independent, amazing, uh, science producing machine and they expand the science your group can do. At the University of Texas Department of Astronomy, two thirds of the research we do is done by graduates. The thing that surprised Mike and I is it takes two years for a grad student to get to that level. You know how long it takes an undergraduate to get to that level? Two years. <laughs> you see, it's doing, that just yeah. proves Medawar's point. It's yeah. doing the research that gives you that edge, that polishes, that's not the sequence of courses you take. You need that background knowledge, don't get me wrong, that's important, those are hoops you gotta jump through. But it's doing the research that makes you better at doing the research. <laughs> anyway, okay, I, I just thought I'd add. No, no, thanks Don, I, I really wanted you to say that. Right, we've got this yeah. now to be able to scan cards for computer access, do you wanna wait till the end to do that? Or that's a good how question. Long how long do you think it'll take yeah, to do about 30? Okay, maybe row by row. Yeah, we in order to get into the computer lab on the 15th floor, that you have to scan your ID. So does uh, have, anybody not have their ID? Because if you don't have your ID with you, you'll have to make arrangements, okay? To make arrangements to get scanned later. Can so anyway, how about, how about everybody on the front row? Go back there. <laughs> this is kind of weird. And meanwhile, do you put up the dancing scroll? I put the dancing squirrel up. Okay, so uh, these are great words from Don, and I'm really, really glad he came and was able to say that. I wanted to say exactly that. Yeah, do you have more to say? No, no, I just was saying that the, I, I got a cruise about 3.30. Sure, 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 sure. Um, 
Let's see. So in the second half, you, we're going to do research projects. Um, and then I put a sentence in boldface. It is mandatory that you obtain a lab book and that you use it to document your progress in the research portion of this course. Now this is the professional level lab book. Uh, most people have the green lab book, which is, like me. yeah, <laughs> which I just happen to have one of these. Yeah, and so, g yes, exactly, one of those. Go buy one. Just do it. Um, we're going to look at them every week or every other week, and it's part of your grade. Uh, it's just absolutely necessary to do. You can take lab, uh, you can take notes from this part of the course in there, but the labs should be reflected in notes that you take there. Um, yeah? Where are those available? I assume the co-op. Yeah, there's some co-op. And it's, we're not doing this again because it's a silly requirement. No, no, no. Because we think it's a good idea. No. Because, in fact, you can't, unless you write stuff down, I have, I used to, when I was young and very arrogant, I thought, I'm going to remember everything. And you don't, of course. No, not even so close. Reality, oh, crap, what was it Mike said? Oh, oh yeah, and you've written it down, you're saying. So you must have a research notebook. And we're just protecting you from yourselves. Uh, sure yeah, and we're making it easy on ourselves, too. Because when you come and talk to us and you're doing the research project, the second half of the course, I'll say, how far did you get last week? And usually I kind of, a lot of times, get a blank stare. Like, I don't know. I'm like, well, look in your notebook. You should have written down how far you got. That way we all know where we are. So it's not just for coming back to it a year later. It's for coming back a week later, you know? Um, like, I have notebooks like this that go back, well, you know, 15 years. And it's the idea I had on October 25th that I wrote up, you know? And it's fun to go back and read those, because sometimes the ideas are good, and sometimes they're really not so good. And you're wondering, why was I so excited about this idea? <laughs> um, or you read it, and you're going, man, we made zero progress in 15 years. How can this be? Um, but regardless, it's not just for you know, B science movies on TV, where scientists are always writing in lab books. It's, it's, it's a good idea. So the grades, uh, we're going to be broken down this way. The weekly labs you do in the first half of the semester, there's about seven of them. They'll be 25% of your grade. 25% will be just interacting and participating. So that's a subjective evaluation. 25% will be logbooks, you know, the notebook. That's really important. And then the semester project will also be 25%. So if you leave out any of those, you know, if you don't do one of them, you automatically have a C. If you don't do two of them, you automatically fail. So think of them as all, I have to do all of them all the way. Um, people don't seem to quite get that a lot. Like in a, a 301 course I taught last semester, you know, where there were more components to the grade, and one of them was an observing component, which was 10% of your grade. And people are like, well, that's only 10%. If you don't do it, you've automatically made a B, you know? That's, how, that's what that means. You've automatically lost a letter grade. And so um, all of these components are very, very important. Let's do them. Um, th that's a good question. Is it a plus minus class? Oh, I should have made this decision already. Uh, can I make it for you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So here's what I do, generally speaking, and I recommend it. <sighs> you know, we can vote on it. But until UT gives us an A plus as a possibility, I don't see any reason to use minuses. Minuses just punish your GPA. So we can use the pluses, and that's great, but we will not use the minuses is what I would propose. OK. Until, once they give us an A plus, then we're done. OK. But, but until then, and we, don't, we aren't there yet, let's use the pluses, but not minuses. OK. <laughs> that's right. The motion carries by acclamation. Um, all right, and the, the various techniques I've listed down here at the bottom are time series observations, CCD data reduction, um, frequency analysis, plotting, mathematical modeling of pulsations, numerical simulations, blah, blah, blah. And there's a link down here on the bottom uh, to all the rules and regulations of the UT Astronomy Department. That's the thing at the very bottom on a web page. And, and basically, they're just telling you that if you start to have trouble in any of your classes, talk to people because there's probably alternatives. Uh, it's not designed for this class so much, but a, a large lecture where people may feel isolated, they say, you know, seek out help. There is actually a lot of free help available for uh, course material. Okay, well, since we're trying to get these uh, preliminaries out of the way, um, I mean, while we scan cards, 
let's see. Now they're very nicely arranged in the wrong direction, aren't they? So you can't turn off the lights at the front of the classroom. How many students um, stay for like an undergrad thesis like past MRI? You mean with us yeah. or in general in astronomy? Well, we've only have one, we've had one year graduate so far. This is the fifth year we've done it. And so we had an initial class of six. Three of them graduated. Three of them are graduating this year, but three of them graduated last year. Actually, two of them graduated last year. One of them's working on graduating this year. <laughs> oh, actually, two more are working on graduating. It's complicated. Two of the original six did a thesis with us. That's the only statistics we have. And, um, well, let's, let's point out. Okay. So the bar is pretty high. Oh, yeah. Three of them graduated. Three of them were uh, deans honored graduates. So one of seven of the entire college deans honored graduates were from this spring. There are only 21 deans honored graduates throughout natural sciences, and three of them were either a former mentor or a former student. And, Arena, I think you've won several of these fellowship things. Uh, I forget what they're called. <laughs> I don't remember either. Presidential scholarship things. Oh, endowed presidential scholarship? Yes. Yeah. And, and as had Jennifer and George and Kevin. Multiple and times. Multiple people. And George Miller last year was the top uh, student at UT. He won the $20,000 cash prize for the uh, Mitchell Award. For so undergraduate Martin research. What but they're trying to say is that these are good people to know, you know, for you to write letters or recommendations, and they will support you all the way. <laughs> trying to say that this, this you guys are all bright and hopefully you will find this stimulating and it'll challenge you and you'll be maybe better than you would have already been which was already going to be exactly good. <coughs> That's all right. yeah um although what arena said is true we certainly support you as well absolutely um and another thing is the one thing all those students have in common is a lot of initiative not just ability but um, going out and doing things that we didn't even necessarily ask them to do, but they just thought it was a good idea. And um, that's kind of the way, re that's the good thing about being a researcher, you know? You set your own agenda. You're like doing stuff and you're like, well, I think the best approach would be this. And you can go do that because you're the one doing it. It's not somebody telling you, do it this way. With George, a lot of times, you know, he'd say, well, I'm going to go do this. And we'd sit down and talk about it. And I'd say, well, you might want to check this, blah, blah, blah. And he'd come back a week later and show me what he'd done. And he'd say, I'd say, well, did you check that? And he said, yeah, but that just didn't work. He said, so I did this other thing, and it turned up all this stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, awesome. You know, you're doing a better job on this than I would have. Or, you know, he, certainly from a distance, I was not approaching the problem nearly as intelligently as he was. And so it's not the military. You know, in the military, you disobey your commanding officer. It's a real bad thing. But if you disobey us and you come up with something better, you're a star. You know, that's, that's what we want. We want, we want initiative and, uh, so anyway, here's the people in our group. This is Don, this is me. These are grad students. Ross is at Sandia. JJ is here, actually at McDonald right now. Keaton's in the back of the room. Thomas Gomez is another grad student. And here's our FRI mentors as of right now. I couldn't even begin to lift all the FRI students, but here's the mentors <coughs> as of right now. Um, and that's a goofy little model of a pulsating star. Um, the, the luminosity variations that you might see on the surface of a pulsating white dwarf star. Um, we're going to cover this stuff in a, another week or two, but I just want to um, orient you. So I said we study white dwarf stars, which are I hate the word dead star, but they're stars that have been through the, the part of the life cycle that our sun is in right now. And yeah, they're seasoned, <laughs> well seasoned. And so this is a star that's like our sun. It's burning hydrogen. This is a star that's a white dwarf. It's not burning hydrogen. It's sort of collapsed. And you can see the size difference is huge. Um, this is, yeah, probably has, that's a good question probably has a carbon oxygen core, but it might even be heavier. We don't really know about Sirius B, do we? Um, it's a, not a typical white dwarf. Um, and of course, Sirius is one of the brightest stars in the sky because it's close. Um, so this just gives you white dwarfs are faint. Uh, but it turns out that this star, oh, and I don't think I have the other one, darn it. I don't. This star is actually a lot brighter in the x-ray. 
Um, but we'll cover that in a couple of weeks. So your typical white dwarf has carbon and oxygen in its core and a tiny little thin layer of helium. And on top of that, a tinier and even thinner layer of hydrogen. So it's kind of like you took a carbon and oxygen core and you sprayed it with some helium paint and then you sprayed it with some hydrogen paint and that's it. But of course, you know, the Earth is sort of the same way. You know, you got the Earth and then the atmosphere is this little thin thing on the top. So um, it, it's a similar scale. So 0.1% helium and 0.0001% hydrogen. So white dwarfs are actually quite simple. Um, and that's one reason we study them. They can pulsate, so this is sort of an artist's conception or a computer program's conception of what the surface of a white dwarf might look like as it, um, as it pulsates. And uh, of course, you're so far away from the star that you don't see the disk. It just is a point of light. So all you see is a point of light that gets brighter and dimmer, and that's what this is. So this corresponds to like 20% brighter, and this corresponds to like 5% dimmer. And the average value is about one. And so when you're at the telescope, this is what you see, at least after you reduce your data, this is what you see. Um, and what we think the star is really doing is something like that. And I've used the uh, color coding where blue is hotter and red is cooler. Does anybody know why I would do that? OK. That's how it really is, right? But everybody thinks a blue is connected with cold because your hands turn blue when they're cold. OK, well, good. I'm glad that, yeah, you had a question? OK. Yeah, I'm glad you've been disabused of that. It was so hard getting IDL to do that, though. Apparently, engineers do it the other way around. That big numbers are red because they're exciting, <laughs> you know, like, like a race car. And uh, I just, it, was, it was just horrible. Um, so anyway, white dwarfs don't have nuclear reactions, so all they're doing is cooling off. And you can think of it, therefore, the cooler they are, the uh, older they are. So if you think of a cup of coffee, you just hook up the coffee maker, and it produces a cup of coffee, and it's real hot. And so you take it out and put it on the surface of the table, and then you measure its temperature with respect to time. It'll eventually go from very hot down to room temperature. And of course, it does a lot of cooling off early. And then the rest of the time, it's slowly um, approaching uh, room temperature. I love this verb, asymptoting. <laughs> it's asymptoting to room temperature. OK, well, a white dwarf, it turns out, does exactly the same thing, except, of course, now time instead of minutes is in billions of years. Um, so that's right. So. This initial time where it cools off a lot really doesn't take much time. But the long, long time where it's going from 3 billion to 4 to 5, 6 out to 10 billion years, this takes forever. Um, and it takes about 10 billion years for a white dwarf, a typical one, to cool down to 4,000 Kelvin. And you see this number's in red because we consider that cool, 4,000 Kelvin. The sun's about 6,000 Kelvin, and the white dwarfs that pulsate are about 12,000 Kelvin. So 4,000 is, is relatively cool. And the reason I made it blue here is because typically they look blue. Um, usually when you look in a field of stars, the white dwarfs are the blue ones because they're a little bit hotter than our sun. That's just the typical ones you see. All right, we're going through this pretty fast because I don't want to burden you down too much with stuff. Now, if I took a cup of water and I kept cooling it down, what would happen as it gets to zero degrees centigrade? What's the colloquial term for that? Solid. It would freeze. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess you could call it a lattice. Um, yeah, it would freeze. It turns out that white dwarfs, you know, atoms are made of a charged nucleus with, say, protons and neutrons and electrons going around it. Well, the white dwarf is so dense in the center that all the electrons are squeezed out. So you've got these positive nuclei and this sea of electrons just floating around unattached. So the positive nuclei, when they get close to each other, they repel. That's what these, uh, these dots represent, the nuclei. So the electrons are here everywhere, but they're just uniform, and they don't participate. But as the ions cool off and they move slower, they eventually start to push on each other so hard that they don't have enough residual energy to get between themselves, if you know what I mean. Electron degeneracy pressure? Electron degeneracy pressure is holding up the whole star. 
but it's the force between the ions, which is really just a classical gas of ions. So how many people know what an ideal gas is? What's an ideal gas? Yeah, yeah, a bunch of billiard balls, right? Tiny little billiard balls bouncing off each other. Um, so to first approximation, that's what the ions are, except they're not ideal because they have Coulomb repulsion. You know, imagine a bunch of little charged billiard balls bouncing off each other. Um, turns out that would act pretty much the same as a regular old gas. Um, whereas the electrons are this, they're degenerate, which is a quantum thing, and they're moving really fast, but they can't interact with anything. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like us in this air in the room. You know, the air is everywhere, but as we, as we walk around, the air just sort of gets out of our way. So we're like the ions. So the ions are the big heavy things. And as they cool off, the Coulomb repulsion between them keeps them or locks them into a lattice structure. Um, does anybody know how crystals form on the Earth? You know, like diamonds. I mean, just in general, not in particular. Yeah. Why does that do any good? I mean, let me rephrase it. What has to happen in order to get a crystal that's analogous to this? It has to start out in an initial state and, th and then pass to a final state. You're, you're right about the pressure. What happens when you add a lot of pressure to something? Right, and what happens? Increased interactions between the particles and they're forced to... Kinda. Kinda. I think there's a simpler one. Where do, where do you often find mineral deposits that are interesting in the Earth? Yeah, they're often associated with volcanoes, right? What, what's a volcano got that other things don't Higher got? Temperature. Higher temperatures. And what happens when things get hot? They melt. Okay. Because, so if you start out with something in a liquid state, that's a lot like this simulation when it's hot, right? Because the liquid, the little molecules are just running all over. So imagine this is carbon molecules in the earth again. So now as they start to cool off, as they start to cool off the intermolecular forces, now imagine these are carbon atoms and they're somehow electron bonding with the previous ones. When they start out nice and liquid, they can move wherever they want and then they can find those perfect little lattice spots, right? But if you just take something and put it under high pressure and go whack, they don't have the freedom to move around and find those perfect little spots in the lattice. You see what I mean? Um, if anybody's into metallurgy, um, you can take a metal and, if you, and make a sword, and if you cool it off really slow, you get long chains of uh, atoms binding to each other, but it, sort of like this. But if you take it and instead you dump it into water, it freezes fast. And the atoms don't have time to find these perfect little lattice sites to sit into, and it makes a totally different property. It actually makes the sword a bit stronger to do that. If you make it and you cool it off really slow, you get these long crystalline chains of particles, but you know, the bad thing about long crystalline chains is they can break along the crystalline structure, right? So you can get a fracture that runs way down, but if you flash freeze it, then the molecules are kind of jumbled and they don't have a preferred axis you can break things on. It's kind of cool. So if anybody's into like Japanese sword making, um, you know. <laughs> All right, um, well here's a globular cluster. Um, <laughs> let's see. So if this is the Milky Way galaxy, <laughs> not very good. <laughs> and this is the Milky Way galaxy on drugs. <laughs> um, so imagine that this is, and here's the sun right about here, and here's the center. Then there's these things called globular clusters, which are sort of like freckles. And they're uniformly distributed well, spherically, symmetrically distributed about the center of our galaxy in 3D. You know, because our galaxy is flat like a pancake. The distribution in globular clusters is not. It's round. That's bizarre. Um, these guys seem to be fundamentally different than these guys. And most of the stars in these guys are older than the stars in the galaxy. 
So there's some of these that are up to 12 billion years old, and we only think the universe is about 13 and a half billion years old. Um, so anyway, here is one such cluster, globular cluster, NGC 6397. Now typically they're pretty far away, and you know I told you white dwarfs are faint, so they're hard to see when they're far away. And until recently we weren't able to see white dwarfs in globular clusters, but with the advent of the Hubble Space Telescope and lots of time, yeah, yeah, and uh, you can find white dwarfs um, in a subset of this, and we've actually done that. And since this is a very, very quick review, I don't have any more pretty pictures. Um, here's a plot that I'm not sure I want to talk about, <laughs> but you know the cup of coffee example? It cooled off really fast at the beginning and then was really slow. So imagine you had a whole bunch of servers all putting out coffee at random times, okay? And then you said, okay, at one instant in time, I'm going to go through and count how many hot cups there are, how many medium hot cups, and how many cool cups there are. Well, the hot cups, those would only be the ones that were put out in the last minute, right? Because things cool off real fast. Whereas stuff hangs around down here in the cool end forever. So there'd be a ton of them that are kind of cool. And there'd be, in the middle where they're just sort of warm, there'd be some intermediate value. Well, we can do the same thing with white dwarfs. They're continuously being minted, continuously being made, <coughs> but they cool off real fast when they're hot, so you don't find very many of them. This is a plot of, this is cool in that direction. So this is hot, cool. This is how many you find. So of the hot white dwarfs, you only find a few. As you look cooler and cooler, you find more and more white dwarfs, and, to give away the punchline. Well, actually, I won't give away the punchline. <laughs> why, why does this curve, if, if there's more and more at cooler and cooler temperatures, why doesn't this curve just keep going up to the right? You know, if I look down here at what would be like 2,000 degrees Kelvin, this is like three or 4,000 degrees Kelvin, this is 2,000, why don't I see a ton of white dwarfs? Because they're passing electrons and carrying pressure, so that's no, they can, the edge of the universe is relevant. Why? Okay, so you're telling me that the white dwarfs that would be down here would have to be how old? 20 billion years and the universe is only 13 billion years old? It turns out that's actually right. So that graph is changing all the time? Well, yeah, well, every 13 billion years. <laughs> it's a real slow thing. Um, Don Winget, who was just here, is the first guy to actually realize this. Um, can anybody think of an observational reason uh, this graph might have a drop-off? Yeah, they're, if maybe they're too faint for us to see. So what people used to think is, well, we just lose sensitivity about here, and that's why we don't see them. But the observers were getting better and better and saying, you know, I think, we're, I think we'd see them if they were there. But then the theorists came along and said, well, no, 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 our models start cooling off really rapidly here, and so these stars would quickly evolve through here and wind up over here where we couldn't see them. And Don came along and said, well, actually, I don't think so. I think, I think your models are wrong. And at the time, there were lots of five different models. People were doing models. And he said, well, you guys are leaving out this physics. You guys are leaving out this other physics. If we adjust all the physics that each group is leaving out, we actually get a s set of sequences that look the same. And so he was able to demonstrate that if you put in the right physics, you, you, would, you would get a curve that frankly looks more like this if the universe were, were infinitely old. It would turn over, but it would still be up here. Um, and you don't. You get this. And so this is what you would get for various different um, <laughs> amounts of dark matter. <laughs> yeah, this was a speculative thing I worked on a year ago. Um, you know, you've heard, how many people have heard of dark matter? And you know we don't know anything about it, right? We don't know if, I mean, we assume it's a bunch of particles, but we don't even know what kind of particles. And so it's kind of like the tooth fairy. You can imagine it might do anything. Uh, and a lot of theories of dark matter said, well, actually it should interact with the interiors of white dwarf stars, and it's streaming everywhere, and it could get absorbed by them. And if that happens, it would actually heat up white dwarf stars. And so... <coughs> What I did is some calculations that say, well, if you have this amount of hot, uh, heating, it'll keep the white dwarfs from cooling off beyond this point, and so you get a peak here, or you get a peak here, 
or you get a peak here. And the point is, what can we constrain from the present day observations? We can already rule out dark matter absorption at this level here, and probably in the next five years we can rule this out. I'm not saying this is super duper significant work, but you know, it's neat to see that uh, white dwarfs are actually relevant for this, this, these kinds of things. Are the other graphs, like, the other graphs are inclusive of dark matter and the black graph isn't? Or what? The black graph is what you get from standard evolution with no dark matter heating. Oh, okay. And this is if you have various <laughs> levels of dark matter heating. Um, the giant Magellan telescope that we're building would probably be able to go out to about here. Um, but that's not going to come online for another five to ten years. All right, well, I think I need to let you guys about go. Let me just put up one <coughs> final thing. So has everybody's card been scanned? Is everybody's card been scanned? Everybody who has a card. Okay. All right, guys. Well, yeah, Arena. Yeah, we're doing labs. So the very first lab will be uh, next. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, real quick. Yeah, what do you mean?